contract until next week, right? Correct. So um, let me uh, talk about. Sorry. It's a lab practical. I'll be in lab, which is on Monday. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm leaving on Wednesday. Um, so uh, the material for the practical, which you need to prepare, and um, some other stuff, is in. Um, the practical folder, um, which <laughs> um, I haven't updated the dates yet. Uh, <clears throat> when I changed ske the schedule around for meeting day, uh, making up snow days, um, I made the change in the syllabus schedule, and I didn't change these dates here. So, um, oh no, that's right. Uh, uh, those dates reflect when lecture is, not lab necessarily. Um, so uh, um, you'll actually be taking the lab practical next Monday, which is the 9th. Um, you'll actually see only three things in this folder, uh, like this. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the reason why there's only three things and not the four that were just there is um, I actually have two versions of this test. Um, and so I have unavailable to you and not visible to you the other version because that's not the version we're using this semester. Um, so just a second, just a second, take a moment, whatever, I don't know what I'm saying there yet. Um, talk about version things. It says there practical 1.2 and then 1.2a. Um, this is the first practical for AP2. That's what the 1.2 means. And then I have two versions, A and B. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> the outline at the beginning is just an overview of everything that um, we've done so far this semester, as far as labs concerned. <clears throat> um, so that's just broad. It doesn't have an A or a B after it because that's the same no matter what. Um, and uh, that's just going to be kind of a, a very broad strokes approach to what this semester's been so far. Um, personally, I'm not a huge fan of outlines. When I was a student, I didn't really use them too often. Um, but I had teachers that said, OK, I want you to make an outline of such and such before writing a paper or whatever. It's like, oh my god, it's just extra work to do. Because um, I never worked quite that way. Um, and uh, so what I've done here is actually outline her uh, quite a while back, um, just to give students uh, an overview of what um, the course is about. Um, with that in mind, when I provide an outline like this, uh, it's not supposed to be some sort of legal document that says what's on that outline is what's on the test, and it's not on that outline, it's not on the test. Um, it's more meant to be some uh, guidelines. As you're preparing for these things, the outline is there. For you to remind yourself of what we've done so far this semester. Um, if you feel comfortable with the subject, if uh, the little bit that's mentioned in the outline uh, <clears throat> reminds you of what we covered and you can flesh it out a little bit more um, from your notes or from your uh, what you've learned, that's great. If you're looking at something you don't understand, uh, what it has to do with anything we've done, then that's a clue that you need to look a little bit more in depth about what we covered in that, that, that section. Um, that's weird. Uh, excuse me. My phone's not supposed to be during class. Um, <clears throat> anyways, uh, so that's the point of the outline, just to remind you of what we've gone over. Um, and I have made it kind of, uh, well, I made it a while back, so it's it doesn't entirely correspond to how I present stuff uh, nowadays, which was just only about time, I mean, that time, um, order. Uh, it starts with the autonomic system, and then it talks about uh, special senses. Um, since I wrote that outline, I, I used special senses first. 
Um, but uh, they're both in the outline. It doesn't matter which order they go in. Um, so the, uh, the next thing there is the cases, which we've looked at already when we were talking about the autonomic system. We went into that document to look at the first case, which was about the autonomic system. Um, in doing that, I uh, <clears throat> modeled for you uh, what I expect you to do when you look at cases for this course, which is uh, be sure you're familiar with the terminology, make sure that you can pull out any symptoms or signs that are described in the case, and um, come up with a corresponding list of the systems in the, in the body which are affected based on those symptoms and signs. Um, now, the case we went over in class on the autonomic system, we went into a bit more depth because we were using it uh, to understand more about that system. But uh, as far as preparing for things, I'm expecting that you will go through the other three cases in that document. Be sure that you understand the terminology, uh, the symptoms and signs, and the system. Um, now, the point of the cases is really that's what the test is based on. Um, the way that I test uh, for the laboratory practical is different probably from the way a lot of my colleagues do it. Um, I think it's better for the practical exam to tie into real world types of examples like you might be using in uh, your career so that you can understand how the material that we're covering in this class relates to clinical situations. Um, so those, there are those cases for you to learn from. Um, now the test actually has two parts. There's an in-class part, which is what you'll be doing next week in class, and in-class part. Um, and then there's an online part, which is the third thing up there, and I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, now the in-class portion that you're going to be doing next week is a 50 multiple choice question test. Um, over those cases. Now there are four cases, 50 questions, and four does not divide into 50 evenly. So um, there's 12 or 13 questions per case roughly. Um, within, oh, uh, and actually my AMP1 classes have started taking their practicals so I can actually show you a physical practical. Um, this is what uh, my AMP1 classes are doing. Um, so it starts with a uh, uh, place for you to put your name, of course, and then on the test it has the case printed out here. Now you'll need to study the cases ahead of time, make sure you understand what they're about, but you don't need to memorize the cases, they'll be on the test there in front of you. And then case one is followed with the dozen or so questions about it, and then there's case two with its <clears throat> dozen or so questions, and then case three with its dozen or so questions, and finally case four with its dozen or so questions. Um, so this is what I'm going to hand out to you when you come in next week uh, for the test. And of those dozen or so questions, um, I like to just describe them as having uh, three sort of <coughs> The first type is what I call a question about the case. So I am anticipating that you have prepared for things uh, following the terminology, symptoms, and systems approach that I modeled for you. So I could ask you questions along those lines. Um, as an example for that, um, in that AMP1 uh, test, one of the cases um, the patient has a bad cough because uh, she's accumulating excess mucus in her lungs. Uh, so I could ask a question along the lines of um, uh, what type of cell produces the mucus that's found in the lungs? So what would that be? Can you repeat the question again? What type of cell produces the mucus found in the lungs. Yeah. 
Now, I have this really silly idea that you being an AMP2 uh, learned things in AMP1 before coming here, so uh, I think it's fair for me to leave this uncomfortable silence waiting for everybody to come up with that answer. What was the question? What type of cells in, uh, what type of cells produce the mucus found in the lungs? Hmm? What was that? Um, well, that's a little. <clears throat> mucosal cells make mucus. It's a mucus, mucus membrane, but what are the cells that do it? Why don't you just sit back and have, have a glass of wine and think about it? That's a hint, folks. That's another name for a glass of wine. Goblet. Goblet. Goblet cells. Remember those guys? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, uh, if anything, that's at least a hint that you need to be sure you understand that sort of basic stuff. I'll anticipate that you remember AMP1 material. Um, that, of course, was an AMP1 practical. And, uh, that doesn't have to be a question on the practical, but that's the sort of thing. So, again, the case is about somebody who's uh, accumulating fluid in their lungs and she's coughing because of that. Um, and so the question was about the basic AMP behind that, the type of cell that's making the mucus that she has. Um, it could also be questions about what terms in the... Um, case mean. I expect that you understand all of the terminology there. Um, or uh, something about the system. Um, just that basic information that I expect that you have coming in. Um, the next type of question of the dozen or so is what I would call <clears throat> questions not about the case, which might sound um, like I could ask you anything. And really the idea here is the cases have to do with material that we've covered in the class. Um, for the cases that we have, it starts with an autonomic system case, uh, and then there's an endocrine case, a woman with diabetes, and then uh, two cases about the cardiovascular system, one about a guy with chest pains, and another about a guy who traveled to South America and forgot to um, do the proper preparations before traveling abroad. Um, so, the case is obviously centered on one of those aspects of those cases, of those units. Um, but I don't want to be trapped into just asking questions about what those cases are about. For example, the endocrine system case is about diabetes, which means that it's specifically going to be focused on which gland. Yeah, thank you. But I want to have the latitude to ask questions about other things. Um, and uh, there's roughly 10 uh, glands that are presented in the endocrine system chapter. Um, and we focused on uh, five of those actually in lab with the um, uh, <coughs> microscope slides that we looked at. But um, so I want a little bit of latitude to ask other kinds of questions. So I'm not just going to ask questions about the pancreas within that case. I might ask questions about the pituitary or the uh, thyroid, parathyroids, those sorts of things. Um, and then the third type of question is what I would call the more traditional type of um, practical question. So if you had AMP1 for somebody, from somebody else, then your practical is probably all of these uh, models and specimens and microscopes that were set up, you had to go around and look at those. Or um, one of my colleagues uh, does oral practicals where you are usually in that little room right there being forced to answer questions about stuff um, from that material, whatever. Those are the more traditional kind of practical things. And so um, what that means is I'm going to have things like this torso model here. I'll have uh, pieces of tape on it, either uh, one piece of tape pointing at something, or four pieces of tape labeled A, B, C, and D. Um, 
and I'll either ask you a question about what the tape is pointing at, or I'll ask you a question, and the four different locations that are indicated by the tape will be the answer choices. Um, I could use models like these torso models or that uh, skeletal column model, something like that. I could use microscope slides. Um, I don't know that there's any that are relevant to this particular uh, practical, but I could use um, uh, specimens like the bones and the card there or something like that. Um, <clears throat> there will be two stations set up for each case, um, and they'll be set up on the outside of the room. Uh, so you'll get to a question that says next to it specifically station something. Okay, so like here at the end of this uh, practical for MP1, I'll ask two questions, say station eight. And so uh, when the student gets to that question, they go over to the station, look at the material and answer the questions based on that. The other questions that don't say station next to them are just regular old um, <coughs> Test questions that you'll be answering, you know, just sitting there uh, at your desk, wherever you happen to choose to sit down. And of course, is exactly what you're sitting there. But um, so those are the three types of questions. In the dozen or so that we're talking about, from those, probably eight to ten will be about the case itself, and two to four uh, about other stuff within the unit that the case represents. Um, the idea here is I'm giving you the cases to tell you kind of what's most important for you to study. Um, you really should be familiar with everything. Uh, one would hope that you've been preparing for this test uh, all along, that you've been studying the material that we've covered from week to week, um, or that you used all those uh, days off with snow to stay at home and study AP. One would hope, but <clears throat> realistically, you probably haven't. Uh, so you're going to spend the next week cramming all the information that you possibly can into your head. Um, now, I usually figure that students can effectively, um, taking that later approach of cramming everything in your head within a week, uh, can probably effectively study about 12, 12 but can effectively study about 20% of the material in the course. Um, so. <clears throat> In sort of the traditional approach, you study stuff and you hope that I ask questions about what you happen to study. Um, with the cases, I'm giving you a clue on what to study. So let's use the endocrine system as an example, okay, 10 different glands. Um, if you were to study 20% of that, then that means that you're going to study two glands in some detail. Um, <clears throat> if you had no idea which glands I'm going to focus on, then you would hope that I'd um, ask questions about the ones that you study. You might say, well, the pituitary is obviously an important gland, so I'll study that one in some depth. And then you might pick another one uh, to study. You might have intention to go through everything, but after a little while, you kind of uh, get bogged down, you have other stuff to study, you move on, whatever it might be. <clears throat> um, in this approach, I tell you that you have to know everything you can about the pancreas. It's definitely there. Um, so you'll spend some time studying on that, but then hopefully you'll have time to move on and look at other stuff, so um, you'll be somewhat prepared for other, other things I might throw at you. Now, you can kind of guess probably what I'm going to ask outside of about the pancreas. Um, I spent time in lab talking about the pituitary, the thyroid, the parathyroid, and the adrenal glands, as well as the pancreas. Those are the tissues that we looked at. So. Um, definitely make sure you understand the, the pancreas because that's what's in the case. But then when you're going to look at the other case, the other glands, start with those that I stressed in, cl in class. So, um, if you're able to study everything, that's great. But if not, at least you're going to start with the stuff that's most relevant to the test. And you'll be most prepared with that. Okay. Um, now with the other uh, units that we studied, it's a little harder to really... Um, break it down like 20% kind of stuff. Uh, for the autonomic system, there's two divisions, and the case is about uh, one of those divisions. Um, so um, you should definitely 
make sure you put most of your time studying the sympathetic system because that's the one that's related to the case. But if you can, look at the other side of things too, the parasympathetic, because you can expect that I'm going to ask a couple of questions about that. But most of the questions are going to be about the sympathetic system. For the cardiovascular system, um, the first one's about the heart, so be sure you're most familiar with that. Um, pay attention to what the case is saying and what parts of the heart are involved in the, system, the uh, problems that he's having, and be sure you know that stuff best. Um, with the other one, he's traveled to South America, he didn't uh, take his preventative medicines, and he came back with uh, an uh, infection in his blood. Uh, the case is pretty upfront about which infection that's going to be because it says specifically he didn't get treatment for such and such. Um, so be sure you're aware of how that particular disease works, which cells in the blood are most directly affected, know the most about those, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but talking about the number of cell uh, glands in the endocrine system, it's a little easier to kind of illustrate the kind of things that you really have to um, sort of focus on. Um, <clears throat> so that's the uh, in-class portion. The <clears throat> online portion, which is the third thing here, this is an assignment, there's 16 more questions, um, four about each case, and they're more open-ended kind of questions. They're more along the lines of the kind of questions you'd see in the part four assignments you've been doing so far this month. Um, one difference, however, is that these are worth two points apiece instead of six points apiece. Uh, with six points, I can be um, <clears throat> a little bit more particular about how I uh, award points. Uh, here, with two points to work with, basically it breaks down to um, if you've read the question, you understand what the question is about, you've done some meaningful research to find the answer, and you've answered appropriately for the question that's asked, then you'll get two points. Um, if <clears throat> your question isn't really on point, there's too much information, too little information, um, or uh, you didn't seem to quite understand the question, you might get one point. Uh, if you're just off base completely, you won't get any points. Um, with that sort of approach to grading, two people could answer completely differently to the same question, but still both get full credit. Um, I'm really looking at how you're approaching the question if you're understanding what it's asking and you're limiting your answer to what the question is actually asking. Um, it's a big problem with students who will often say, um, well, I'm going to put everything I possibly can into this answer and hopefully some of it will be correct. Um, I was grading uh, some blood part four assignments over the weekend and there's one question in there that asks about uh, uh, positive feedback in blood clotting. And I had one student who just told me everything she'd learned about blood clotting, none of which actually had anything to do with, this was not in this class, uh, none of it had anything to do with positive feedback. Um, and all I can imagine is she saw blood clotting in the question and said, well, I'm going to show him that I understood blood clotting. But that actually shows me that she didn't understand the question that was being asked. She didn't find the uh, important point that the question was asking. So she got a zero on that. Um, and I do uh, think along those lines. Now, if she'd happened to mention something in there about positive feedback is common in blood clotting and uh, <clears throat> some reason why it's important for blood clotting, then I might have given her partial credit, but she overanswered the question. She was just saying everything she could imagine might have something to do with the question without really thinking about what the question's asking. Okay. Um, so I do pay attention to that sort of thing <clears throat> in what you're writing. Um, usually with these I have a handful of sort of keywords that I'm looking for, so I'll scan answers to see if the keywords are there. Um, <clears throat> if none of the keywords are there, I'll read it a little bit more in depth, but I won't have high hopes for it. Um, <clears throat> if all of the keywords are there, then um, that's kind of unusual because, again, uh, there's a lot of different ways to answer these questions. I'm usually looking for a couple or a few keywords to show up there. That will guide me to um, what to concentrate, in your, on, concentrate on in reading your answer. 
Um, there are a few questions that are fill in the blank and therefore auto corrected, um, <clears throat> meaning that there's a particular answer I'm looking for, uh, which might be sort of definition wise or um, <clears throat> a very specific thing. For instance, in the AMP1 um, uh, practical, there's a question what system does the spleen belong to? Um, and there's two technically valid answers to that. Um, <clears throat> so it's possible that two people could answer completely differently but still get credit. What system does a spleen belong to? No. Hmm? Right, it's lymphatic. So I don't blame you for not knowing that because we haven't gotten to the lymphatic system yet. I do blame all of my other a and one students for not remembering the answer because they had that question. But yeah, lymphatic. What would be another possible answer to that? Nope. Okay. Again, not blaming anything anybody for not knowing this because we haven't gotten to this part of the um, course. But the lymphatic system and the immune system are actually in the same chapter together because they're related. <clears throat> so anyways, with that fill in the blank one, people should put lymphatic, that's the more appropriate answer, but immune is accepted also because it's functionally part of the immune system. Um, so there might be some things like that. that there's a very limited number of answers um, and that can be autocorrected. Um, so <clears throat> um, those are the kind of things that the online assignment would be covering. Um, like I said, there those questions are two points a piece. So four questions about four different cases. There's 16 questions uh, for a total of 32 points on that. The in-class part is 50 multiple choice questions, and so it's worth 50 points. Um, 50 plus 32 adds up to 82, um, but really the thing is worth 75 points. If you happen to get more than 75 points, if you get 76 through 82, those are sort of extra credit points built into the test. Um, honestly, very few students get extra credit points on this. What it really means for most people is that there's a little bit of breathing room. Um, you're going to take the in-class portion, and then you're probably going to work on the, in the online part after that. Um, the online part isn't due until the next lab meeting that we have. Um, so a lot of people will probably not start working on that. You can if you want to. The, the assignment's there. You're welcome to go into it. Um, especially when you're preparing, you might want to look at the um, online questions. They might give you a little bit um, better read about where the case is going. Um, but uh, you don't have to. Um, so most people will take the in-class portion and um, then they're going to get to the online part. Um, it's possible that for the in-class portion, you might get, say, 38 out of the 50 questions correct, um, which is actually pretty good. Um, anything in the upper 30s and 40s, I consider a good score on that. But really, um, 35 on up is 70% you know, on up. And so a lot of students will go, well, I got 70%, or if it was 38, that's 76%. And they'll go, well, that's a C. I'm not doing very well with this. But that's not the way that this test really works. There's two components. There's the in-class and the online part. So if you get 38 in class and you get 32 points online, that's 70 points. And 70 out of 75 is like 92.5. So that's an A. Um, now, you do have to get the 32 points online, but it's not unheard of. Probably about half of the students uh, in my classes do about that well, 30 or 32 points online, um, because there's a bit of latitude in how I grade those questions. Um, but it does require the effort to be put in. Um, while probably about half of my students get a 30 or a 32 online, the average is probably somewhere in the mid to high 20s, um, just because there are some people that really don't get it and they really kind of fall off the other end and they bring the average down. Um, so uh, be sure you put the effort into that online part, but um, with 
uh, taking the time to research the questions and make sure you understand what your, your answer is supposed to be about, you can do well in that. And it's not unheard of for uh, <clears throat> what looks like a C to turn out into an A, or just to generally across the board to see things go up maybe even two whole letter grades worth of uh, <clears throat> um, a score. But again, I need to say this because students never hear the, the important part of this, which is you have to do that work. Um, if I say uh, <clears throat> your overall grade on the test can be two letter grades higher than what you do in class, students will think, oh, well, if I get a C here, I'm going to get an A, obviously. No, you have to do the work. Okay. Um, it's not guaranteed that's going to happen. It's just that mathematically, it's not at all impossible for that to happen. So um, you shouldn't freak out uh, <clears throat> walking out of here next year. Um, any questions about what the practical is going to be like next year? Will it be like a spectrum? Actually, we're going to use um, an electronic um, entry system, um, which is like you'll get you'll know how you do right away, um, but you don't have to color little dots. Oh, so do you need to bring like a laptop or anything? Or no, um, I have little devices. Um. <coughs> oh, okay. There are these things here. Okay. So you just log in with this, and there's a computer. I mean, there's a receiver in the computer, and it tabulates your answers. And then I can tell you right away when you, when you handed in how you did. So, so you do it all over the paper and then send it after. Right, right. Um, I'll give those specific instructions there. But yeah, you'll take the test and then put your answers in here so it'll tabulate it automatically. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? That's all we're doing next week, um, and uh, it's designed to be done in about an hour. You will have the whole hour and 50 minute period to work on it if you need it, but most of you will probably be done earlier. I wouldn't make plans for 11 o'clock, but you might get out that early. Um, so you might want to tell your work, but you can't be in until noon because you got a test that day, but you might actually be out earlier. Um, Oh, uh, the online part, um, like I said, the next it's due before the next lab meeting date. Um, and uh, next Monday is uh, the Monday before spring break. So this will actually not be due um, until March 22nd. Okay. Because um, our next lab meeting date after the 10th will be the 23rd which is the Monday that we get back from uh, spring break. So you need to complete this by the Sunday at the end of spring break. Um, that's not to say, well, I'm going to screw up your spring break um, and you'll have to work on this over spring break. You're welcome to complete this within the week um, before spring break. It's just that some people won't decide to do that. And so uh, I set the due date there before the next one. Yeah. Can I mention the uh, I think they're technically due on the 12th. Of March? Yeah. So um, are we lab practical? Will that go inside them? No. Nah. No? Um, the uh, thing about midterms, which is kind of annoying, is that it's not a true midterm grade. It's just the 12th is like the exact middle point of the semester. Actually, not anymore because they extended the semester because it's new day, snow days. But whatever. Um, Basically, just on that day, I sit down and I enter in whatever grade you have at that point. Um, for some classes, uh, you might not have any grades at that point in the semester. Um, I've had plenty of advisees who uh, have a an F for their midterm because they're, the only thing at that point for like an English class was some t paper, and they didn't turn it in by that particular date, so there was no grade for them, and they have an F. And then as soon as they turned it in, their grade was a B or something like that. But that's not reflected in the midterm grade. Um, so yes, uh, especially because of snow days, this material won't be completely graded until after that's due. Um, 
for AMP2, of course, there's some anxiety about midterm grades. Um, it's really in, inappropriate for midterm grades to be used for placement into programs because they're not true midterm grades. Um, you can, I think I talked about this in class, you can kind of game the system as far as my class is concerned. Uh, do all sorts of work ahead of time that will just bring your grade up. Uh, you can go ahead and do that. Now, like I said, I think they're due on the 12th. Um, I'll actually be in Chicago by the 12th, so I'll be putting those in um, that Wednesday morning, which I guess is the 11th, um, just because I have to do it before I leave. Um, now, whether you'll be able to see those midterm grades um, until the 12th or not, I don't know, but that's when I'm probably going to put them in. Yeah. So the only thing that's going to be our grades that are reflected on the midterm are just the homework assigned to the quizzes online, right? Any assignments that you've completed up to that point, okay. we'll go into it. Um, what I normally do with this is I put in um, the score that you get on the in-class part, just so I have it in the system, so when I finally grade the online part, I don't have to make sure I have all those grades. But if I do that before midterms, it'll actually bring your overall grade down because that that out of 75 is not very good. Um, so I'll actually not put those in, so I won't score that at all. Um, but um, but otherwise, anything that you've completed, and I'll have graded everything that I have to grade by the 11th, so that I'll have the most up to date score by then. Question? Yeah. Um, so we already have the lecture on Tuesday. Yes, that was actually, originally I had scheduled not to have that Tuesday class because I hadn't decided when I was flying out to Chicago. But then when we had the snow day on the 27th, I canceled our Tuesday class. To make up for that, actually on that snow day, I had made my plans and scheduled to fly out on Wednesday. So we'll definitely be having class. And as always, and I'm actually kind of really tired of answering these questions. As always, if you have any questions about these things, this is a very accurate representation of what we have to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> after the snow days, I went in here and changed this to reflect how things are different. If you ever have a question about when we have class, it's there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and um, I don't know if it was necessarily anybody in this class, but just over the weekend, I, was, I get several emails asking when various things are happening, like when the practical is and that sort of thing. Um, I'm on the verge of just going ahead and answering any questions like that with it's in the syllabus and not giving you any information. Okay, so please, before you email me thinking, well, he always answers my questions, uh, understand that, yes, I answer your questions, but I usually do it with a really nasty scowl on my face. Uh, please look in the material that I've given you for the answers, okay? Um, I am on the verge of uh, transferring that scowl on my face to a rather na nasty answer in my text, so. Um, okay. Um, any other questions about the uh, practical that you have coming up? For those of you that did not have me for AMP1, uh, you might want to corner one of my former students and see if they can give you any insight. Um, and it's basically everybody sitting in the front row right now. Um, they were ha all had me frame P1, so uh, they might have some insight for you. Uh, there's more, of course, in the lecture uh, group. Um, so if some of you sit around and lecture, you happen to know, took me frame P1, feel free to ask for some insight from them. So. Um, okay. So. Uh, we're actually going to start looking at the blood vessels in lecture uh, probably at next uh, tomorrow, um, but I'm not quite sure when it's going to work out because we haven't quite finished up the heart stuff. Um, but here in lab, of course, we are starting this. This is kind of new for us because of all the snow days. Uh, we've been doing stuff very late compared to what we're doing in lecture, but now we're actually kind of on top of things. And I was really scared last night that we were going to have another snow day today, and that really screwed everything up for us. But it didn't, yay. Um, and I haven't gotten any texts from students saying, can't make it to class. I totaled my car on the way in. 
which is always good. I get a lot of those, actually. It's kind of scary. Um, so I want to go into the chapter real quick just to talk about a few things. Um, as far as the lab material is concerned, um, really what this lab is about is to kind of understand uh, what blood vessels look like um, under the microscope and to get to know the particular blood vessels by name. So for instance, in AMP1, uh, <clears throat> you had a point where you were learning the bones by name that made up the skeleton. You had a point where you were learning the muscles by name um, and certain nerves by name. Uh, so this is sort of along the same lines. In AMP1, with the skeleton, there were two chapters that go over um, the uh, bones and the skeleton by name. And then there was one chapter that went over, specifically went over the uh, muscles by name. And um, <clears throat> what's actually going on in this chapter is, let me just open up the whole chapter. Um, there's a section ah, uh, right here, not that you can read it, it says circulatory pathways, um, which is basically the laboratory material uh, for this. With one difference, um, here at the beginning in the structure and function of blood vessels, um, I just want to pull up this picture real quick. Um, we can certainly pull out a microscope image of this, but the book has a perfectly good one here, so I'm going to use this as soon as it loads. Um, <clears throat> so the drawing at the top here isn't what I'm concerned with. It's more the micrograph at the bottom. Um, We'll talk about the structure of uh, blood vessel walls in lecture. Um, but one thing I want to point out with the artery, um, <clears throat> the inner surface is, uh, I guess you could say, kind of scrunched up or wrinkly. Um, the reason for that is that there's elastic tissue in the artery wall. Um, <clears throat> and so as it's... Um, <clears throat> Uh, being elastic and kind of pulling in, it sort of uh, scrunches up the inner wall of the, the artery like we see there. The vein, on the other hand, the inner wall is pretty smooth, relatively speaking. Not perfectly because this is uh, an organic system, but it's definitely much smoother than the artery. Another thing that the elastic tissue does for the artery is that it helps it keep its shape. Um, and that's pretty obvious from this picture. The artery looks pretty much like it's round in cross section. Um, now, to prepare material like this for the microscope, um, the blood is going to be drained from the blood vessels, uh, necessarily so. And the artery maintains its open, round structure. The vein, as you can see there, actually collapses when it's empty. What keeps the vein open is really the presence of blood, the pressure of blood against the wall of the blood for the vein uh, keeps it open. And when it's drained of blood, it collapses because it does not have that elastic tissue. Um, and we can see that pretty easily. Okay? The arteries are always very obvious when you're comparing these kind of things under the microscope because uh, they're so obviously still round, uh, even without the blood in them. Um, it's not terribly obvious from this picture, especially since I have the lights on and we can't see the detail of the micrograph very well, but um, the wall of the artery is usually also thicker than the wall of the vein. Um, if you look at this directly on your um, <coughs> computer, that will be obvious. Uh, the muscular wall of the artery actually extends out to here, so all of this <coughs> is the muscular wall of the artery. The same tissue in the vein is really only a little bit of what we see here. Um, am I pointing the right thing? Yeah. Um, so that part of the vein is equivalent to that part of the artery, and the artery wall is obviously much thicker in terms of that. Um, now, if you can kind of imagine looking at this picture, uh, the artery obviously is, is in its round profile like we'd expect for the reason I just told you. 
the vein isn't. But imagine instead that we inflated the vein and it, what it would look like if it were in fact um, not collapsed as it is in this picture. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you can kind of see that the inner um, diameter or the area uh, suggested by that open vein is actually bigger than the inner area of the artery. Um, arteries, their inner diameter makes them much more narrow than veins. <clears throat> A point I want to talk about in lecture, and I want to set it up with this picture in front of you, us, is that uh, blood flow has to be constant through the system for the most part. Um, <clears throat> now there's a lot of going into that statement that uh, makes it much more complicated than I want to suggest to you, but imagine these two blood vessels are connected to the same uh, organ. Uh, so let's say this is the splenic artery and the splenic vein, meaning that they're both connected to the spleen. Um, the blood going through the artery, going into the spleen, has to be flowing at the same rate as the blood coming out of the spleen through the vein. If there's more blood flowing into the spleen than out, then the spleen's going to fill up with blood. If there's more blood flowing out than in, then the spleen is going to drain of blood. So the input and the output have to be balanced. The thing is, is that the driving force for blood flow is really the pressure that's generated by the contraction of the left ventricle of the heart. And that pushes the blood through the system from the aorta uh, on uh, to the organs, and then it comes back through the veins to the heart. The blood vessel falls off the farther and farther we get from the heart. So what that means just necessarily is that blood pressure is higher in the artery than it is in the vein, okay? Um, which would suggest that the blood flow through the artery is going to be higher than blood flow through the vein, just because the pressure pushing the blood is different. But in fact, it's not, and a lot of that has to do with um, the actual size of the vein relative to the artery. Um, as the artery is narrower, there's also this force acting on blood flow called resistance. Uh, and I'll describe that in more detail in lecture, but the resistance is higher in the artery because it's narrower than it is in the vein. The vein has lower resistance because it's a wider vessel. And so there's less acting against blood flow in the vein, which counteracts the lower pressure there. So the two are actually fairly balanced. Uh, again, so that blood flow in and out of an organ like the spleen is going to be constant, and we're not going to have any um, uh, fall off between the two. Okay. So um, I wanted to point this out in the lab material. Uh, like I said, we could get the, the microscope slides out to look at them, but uh, um, this picture is actually kind of better than anything we have in the um, slide boxes that we have. Now in lecture, I'm going to talk about the rest of this figure and the structure in the walls of the arteries and veins. And I'll talk a little bit about the um, <clears throat> implications of that in terms of blood flow. Um, but I wanted to point it out here. The other thing that I wanted to stress for this uh, lab is the circulatory pathways component. Um, and I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail. Um, it starts off with just this sort of general table talking about um, the vasculature within various systems. Um, and we'll talk about those systems in more detail as we move through the rest of the course. Um, but <clears throat> thinking about those organ systems, their blood supply is usually very important. Uh, we won't be talking about the skin or the bones, for instance, although um, we have uh, in AMP1. And for instance, in the skin, uh, blood supply is very important because it's manipulated in how we regulate body temperature using the skin. Um, so those kinds of things play a part there. Um, <clears throat> we will not be really looking at pulmonary circulation other than to know that it exists. Um, 
this picture doesn't really get into a whole lot of detail anyways, but um, just keep in mind, like I said earlier, that the pulmonary arteries are going to be carrying the blue colored deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary veins are going to be carrying the red oxygenated blood. So the color is going to be different in the pulmonary circulation than elsewhere. Right. Um, <clears throat> so what it does say here really isn't too much more than what I said talking about the heart. What we're really more interested in here are the systemic arteries. So this is, I mean, systemic circulation. So this is an overview of the systemic arteries um, <clears throat> with a little bit of uh, detail of the aorta. Um, circulation to the coronary system, which means the blood supply su that's feeding the heart muscle, um, the blood that's moving through the heart really isn't going to supply the um, blood with, I mean, the heart with much nutrition uh, or oxygen. It's mostly coming from these coronary arteries. Um, the branches off the aortic arch, um, what that means for the head um, and the brain, uh, just showing the very kind of special supply to the brain and um, uh, some specifics of arteries that are uh, in these pictures up here. And then what we see in the thoracic area, um, the abdominal, uh, this is very schematic, um, but uh, <clears throat> showing you the various things that come off of the aorta as it descends through the thorax and the abdomen. Um, and then it branches uh, going into legs. So there's the right and left common iliac arteries, and they just show the branches off the right side. The left side is going to be identical. They're just to save space. They only show it on one side. Um, and then for the arm, uh, here's everything coming off of the aorta, going to the head and neck, and then going off to either arm here. Um, and in the legs, um, again, this is really just showing one leg, but uh, it's doubled left and right. Uh, and then the same sort of thing going through the veins here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to hand out a list of the blood vessels that you need to know, like I did with uh, the bones or the um, muscles or this nerves back in AMP1. Rather, uh, I wanted to point this material out to you. And as you're looking at the cases that you're studying, uh, sure, there's a case about the heart and there's a case about the blood, but blood vessels are relevant for both of those. Uh, so pay attention to what blood vessels are going to be most important for what those cases are talking about. Um, you will have questions about blood vessels. Um, more of the questions will be about the heart and the blood in both of those cases, but um, be ex uh, anticipate blood vessels being covered there and to sort of pay attention to um, which blood vessels are most relevant to what's going on in those cases. Um, and this part of this chapter is basically the, the reference material for what all of those, where all those arteries are. Um, so again, I said earlier that we're not going to spend a lot of time or as much time today in class as normal. Um, that I just wanted to point those things out and let you know where the material is. Uh, and as far as the rest of today's lab period is concerned, um, I'll be up here available to answer any questions you have. You can look at the material that we have. Um, hopefully you or someone near you uh, has a internet capable device. You can look at the cases if you haven't already and be prepared for stuff. Um, and ask me any questions that you might have. So uh, that's the end of what I wanted to cover for today. And really the majority of what I wanted to talk about was how the practical works that you're going to have next week. So.